Thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Anna and Stas for organizing this event. Uh, I'm sure uh, we, all of us underestimate how much time and effort goes into organizing something on this, so let's give Anna and Stas a round of applause. Okay, with that out of the way, um, we can begin. So I'm going to talk about what's been happening in the uh, venture capital world over the last uh, year and a half. Um, for those who don't know me, as uh, Anna has uh, given me a little introduction, how come this is no, okay, yeah, this, I'm pressing the wrong button. So I am a corporate lawyer. I um, specialize in representing venture funds and uh, startups. I, uh, one thing I do want to mention is that I just published the third edition of my Russian language guide to venture capital term sheets. I'm going to have some uh, hard copies uh, after my speech, but uh, if you guys want to uh, get a soft copy, just shoot me an email. My email is right there, and I'll uh, send it to you. Okay, so the agenda for today. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what's happening in the venture capital world. We're going to do an, uh, then we're going to actually skip to uh, what's happening in the seed rounds. We're going to do the seed investment deals uh, terms, and then we're going to uh, talk about the deal terms for the uh, larger venture capital industry. Data, data used. Uh, when I first started practicing here in Silicon Valley about 15 years ago, uh, there was very little data, public data available. So when uh, an investor would uh, tell the founders, uh, everybody does it that way, the founders really had uh, little choice but to agree. But uh, nowadays, uh, there's a lot of data. And the data sets I'm using are from uh, Wilson Sonsini, which is one of the top firms here in Silicon Valley, the firm where I started my career and they publish a quarterly report on all the venture capital deals that they have done. Uh, there's also Fenwick and West, another big law firm in the Silicon Valley. You've got the Dow Jones and the uh, Pricewaterhouse Monetary Report, and uh, also throw in some personal experience. Okay, I'm gonna borrow a term by Fenwick and West called barometer of VC activity. And you see that little graphic, it's a barometer. It basically shows what's been happening. Uh, are things getting better, things are getting worse, Okay, so this, uh, this slide is uh, VC financing across different rounds, from round A to all the way to round you know, X or Z. Um, as you can see, the distribution across the rounds over the last six quarters has been pretty stable, uh, pretty consistent. Um, I'm a little surprised to see so many Series D and Series E rounds, and that's probably because uh, it's difficult to get to liquidity nowadays, so I, I expect as the economy improves, we'll see fewer later rounds. Um, we're gonna talk about this later, but uh, we would like to see more Series A rounds, because um, given the number of seed rounds, uh, a lot of them are not getting to the Series A round. Another important uh, piece of data, what are the median pre-money valuations across different rounds? Uh, and uh, as you can see, the trend has been really, really good. It's been really the, when the market went downhill in 2008, 2009, 2010, the median and pre-money valuations have really gone down. And you know, the last couple of years, there's been steadily improving across all rounds. Oh yeah, so what is the you know, main cause for the increase in uh, valuations? And uh, you know, one reason is the, what's called an Instagram effect. There have been a few high profile investments like uh, Evernote, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, billion dollar valuations pretty early in the company's life. So that's also driving the valuations. The economy is improving. Uh, and also uh, what, uh, explains the uh, increased valuation in the later rounds is that you know, what, one silver lining for the you know, global crisis is that the companies are now using their money better, more efficiently. So they're raising the you know, later rounds when the company has achieved more uh, milestones, uh, has uh, developed its technology better, and that results in a higher valuation. Now another interesting um, piece of data is uh, you know, how much money a company's uh, raising. And um, you can see that uh, in 2013, average Series A round was about 2.4 million. 
And that goes all the way up to 10 million for Series C and later rounds. Um, but if you look at the, so the trends there, uh, you know, it's not like you don't have a steady increase in uh, money raised. It's actually more money was raised in 2008 than in 2012. And what's the, what's the takeaway from this? Uh, you know, as you guys might know that uh, founder share de correlates directly to the pre-money valuation and the amount of money raised. So the lower the valuation, the more money raised, the less uh, share of the founders becomes. Uh, so if you look here, this chart shows what the founder shares is after the first round of investment, the Series A investment. Um, and it's really a great trend. You know, it was uh, all the way down to about 60% in 2008, 2007, and now it's, you know, getting close to 80%. So I, what means, this means after a Series A investment, the investors get about 20, 25%, and the rest goes to the founders. Uh, I do want to give a caveat, uh, as you can see in the slide. This doesn't account for the stock option plan, and the stock option plan, the stock option pool, always comes out of the founder shares. So if the investor tells you we'd like a 20% option pool, you know, that's going to affect you, the founders, not the investor. Um, actually, we can look at uh, what the option pool, um, you know, the trend in the option pool uh, size uh, in the last, I think this graph shows you the last two years. As you can see, the average option pool size is about just under 16%. Uh, but the main, um, distribution is around the 10 to 20 percent mark. So if the investor tells you we'd like a 25 percent option pool, well, that's not standard, and he better have a good reason uh, why so much uh, shares are allocated to the new hires. And uh, it's a little advice to uh, founders here. Um, if an investor tells you we'd like a 20 percent option pool, and uh, you always want to negotiate down because if you end up increasing the option pool, it'll come out of everyone's shares, not just the founder shares. Uh, so you want to build a hiring model. You want to say, well, we already have most of the team in place. We might need you know, to fill some empty spots, so we don't need more than you know, 5 10% option pool. And sometimes it works. If you really have a good hiring model, sometimes the investors will buy it. Okay, now let's look at the valuations across different industries. Um, this is for Series A valuations for deals that are raised less than $2 million, so smaller deals. And you know what's interesting? That non-technology, so retail products, have the highest valuation. And then you have software and life sciences serve tight for second. Here, now we're switching to um, median valuations uh, for sort of larger rounds, still Series A rounds, but uh, which have raised more than two million. Uh, and you, we have two new categories. You got electronics, hardware, and we got semiconductors. And uh, here you can see, you know, whereas uh, the um, non-technology uh, category was uh, the highest, had the highest valuation in the smaller deals, now it's sort of towards the middle. And uh, you've got the internet and software, uh, really uh, tight for the first place. Uh, life science and clean tech, all oh, those are really lagging behind. So that's, that, this uh, graphs about the last uh, six to eight quarters and uh, life sciences and clean tech are not doing well. And if you go back to my original slide of the founder shares, uh, you can see that uh, for life science and clean tech deals, founders really get you know, after the first round of investment, they end up having less than half the, of the company. So that's just not good. Okay, so these are up rounds and down rounds. So we'd like to see as few down rounds as possible. But so if you can take a look, in 2009, down rounds were up to 40%. Up rounds were under 40%. Things were going really, really poorly. Uh, in the last uh, quarter of this year, you know, the down rounds are just about 20%, up rounds are 70%. So this is a really good trend, and I, I expect it to continue improving. Of course, a lot depends on the round. So for instance, the Series B rounds, very few of them have down rounds. You know, we're talking about less than 5%, both in 2012 and the first quarter of this year. 
Whereas when you get to the later rounds, well, we're, up, we're in the 20% territory. And that's probably because still the exit environment is difficult. There have been a few IPOs. And um, I would say usually in, um, in cases here like this, uh, it's the existing investors that are um, doing another round. And uh, so the down rounds are usually caused by existing investors who don't want to lose their investment. Also, the number of down rounds depends on the industry. Um, software, very few down rounds, less than 10%. Life science, well, you can see in 2013, it's up to 35%. So life science is not doing very well. Clean tech, we're in the 20% territory. So I remember life science, clean tech, just not doing well, have not, been, have not done well in the last few years. Oh, that's an under, that's actually, that's an interesting slide. It shows you what is the price increase as you go from one round to another round. Um, I often have uh, people come to me and say, well, we raised the Series A round, and now we are looking to raise Series B round, and we want to do it at five times the valuation of the Series A round. Well, it doesn't happen. It's very unusual that you can get such a big increase in valuation. Uh, so. Between the average increase, the median increase uh, in price from Series A to Series B is about 2.2x, which is pretty good, but it's not definitely not 5 or 10, what you know, a lot of founders want. But as you go down towards the later rounds, you know, as uh, you go down to the later rounds, the uh, percentage increase decreases. So Series D rounds, we're really only talking about you know, 15 to 20% increase. So it's sort of you know, sobering information. A lot of founders uh, overestimate uh, how you know, much their company is worth. So, unless, so if you want to build those numbers, you really have to have some great results. Oh yeah, this is also the same slide but across the industry. So if you look at software, software is doing really well. And this includes data from all rounds, not just from A to B, but you know, across all rounds. So the average in software is almost 2x. Whereas if you go to life science, well, it's almost negligible, especially in uh, 2013. So I guess the takeaway, don't, don't invest in life sciences. OK, now let's switch to uh, seed round investments, because they're a little different from Series A and um, later round investments. First of all, Last three years have been really, uh, there have been a lot of seed investments. Uh, I recall when I started practicing, there were very few. Venture funds did not invest in seed at all. You could, you know, you, maybe I saw one in, in a year of practice. Uh, nowadays, however, um, for instance, this is the information from the first quarter of 2013. And three of the six largest VC investors by uh, the number of deals uh, were seed focused funds. That's 500 startups, Y Combinator, and first round capital. Um, as you can see, the number of seed financings you know, went up fourfold in three years. Um, what's even more interesting is that the seed investments make up over 30% of all VC investments. And like I said, when I was started practicing it, they might have made up 5%. Also, growth in accelerators. Um, there are about 150 accelerators right now across the world. Uh, and the, the number of companies they fund has increased you know, to 1,200 from about 250. So where are the seed investments going? You're not going to have a seed investment in hardware. It's too capital intensive. So about all of them go into an internet of software. And internet makes up about 70%. Software makes up you know, between 25 and 30%. No seed investments in life sciences either. Uh, oh, who is making the seed investments now? As you can look at 2010, that's only two and a half years ago. Um, professional angels uh, made up about 30% of uh, seed investments. Uh, if you go down to 2012, it's down to 20%. In, but instead, you see venture capital funds, which are really increasing their seed activity. So you know, from 25% to almost 35%. So you, I would say you know, this trend is going to continue, and probably professional angels are being squeezed out. 
A lot of people ask, you know, when you want to do a seed, in, uh, seed investment, do you do it by uh, regular stock purchase or do it a convertible note? And a lot of people think that most seed investments are done through a convertible note. Well, that's not true. Only about 30% are done by convertible notes and the rest are done through just regular preferred stock purchase. How much is invested? Well, if you look 2010, 2011, um, it's about a million dollars. So the average immediate seed investment is about a million bucks. It depends somewhat on whether you're doing a convertible note or preferred stock investment. Uh, for instance, in 2012, it's about a you know 30% difference in, uh, in the amount of money invested. But I, I expect 2013 it'll sort of come down to about a million dollars. Oh yeah, that, that's so, so far so good. But this is actually quite uh, unfortunate. Um, as we talked before, uh, the number of seed investments is skyrocketing. However, the number of uh, Series A investments keeping steady. Um, so you can see that the number of seed financings increased you know, from 400 to almost 1,800. And the number of Series A rounds really stayed about the same. So what, what does it mean? That means that I'll give an example. In 2010, 45% of companies that raised seed money uh, raised Series A investment by the end of next year. So we're talking about 18 months uh, average span. 2011, only 27% uh, of the seed financings actually went to raise uh, Series A funding. Uh, what happens to the rest of the companies? Uh, some of them uh, raise uh, full-on seed investments. Some of them um, get acquired, but uh, a lot of them get shut down. I would say probably half of all seed companies that uh, were founded uh, in 2011 are no longer operating. So that's, uh, that's pretty sad. So if you raise uh, seed money, uh, chances are you're not going to raise this year's A round, so don't go and buy a new BMW. That's, that's the takeaway. Okay, so moving on to um, what are the deal terms for seed investments? Seed investments are a little different from regular venture capital investments. Um, Let's talk about preferred stock financings. Um, there's a different set of documents. Usually a different set of documents is used. It's called a serious seed uh, set of documents, uh, which are simplified versions of venture capital financing documents. Uh, there's no anti-dilution rights. There's no right of first refusal co-sale rights, no registration rights. The investor doesn't get any preferred dividends, uh, have limited veto rights, uh, limited drag along. Legal fees, a lot of people say, well, how much would you charge to do a seed financing? Um, we're talking about less than 10,000 bucks. If an investor, you know, if a lawyer tells you it's gonna cost you 25 grand, they can go find another lawyer, because mo most of the uh, seed financings are done for between five and $10,000. Um, what about the uh, board of directors? Well, the investor gets a board seat in about 70% of the deals. Uh, whereas in a Series A financing, it's in 99.9% .9 of the deals. Liquidation preference. It's always non-participating liquidation preference. Investor tries to have a participating liquidation preference. That's not market. Uh, about 90% are non-participating. Now, let's talk about convertible note financings. Uh, so like we said, uh, they're used in about 35% of all financings. They're probably used in most really small financings under 250,000. Uh, median interest rate is 5.5%. Uh, uh, I've seen notes with about 10 to 12%. That's not market. Uh, market is really about 5 to 6%. How long is the note, um, you know, when is the note mature? It used to be six years ago, it used to be one year. Now it's really up to 18 months. Um, actually, in the last quarter, I've seen mostly you know, 24, even 36 months maturity dates. Oops. Yeah, also, if you guys know, probably know that uh, convertible notes convert into uh, shares of the company, uh, and they usually convert at a discount, and the median discount is 20%. So you can take a look, you know, so about 30% are less than 20%, about another 50% are 20%, and you got about, you know, 30% over 20% discount. Uh, but uh, I would say out of 20 no deals that I've done in the last year, uh, I think the average was close to about 20%. Uh, 
valuation caps. A lot of uh, convertible notes have valuation caps. Actually, it's uh, about 85% of the deals have a valuation cap, and the valuation cap is about six million, and that, that actually helps the investor. A lot of very infrequently used terms, and uh, I've seen investors try to convince the founder to accept these terms. For instance, like you get a board seat when you do a note financing. It almost never happens. Uh, sometimes the investor says, well, you know, why don't you uh, pledge your house or the IP of the company? Uh, never happens. 2%. Uh, when the investor sometimes says, uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, don't get any other debt except, you know, the note. Uh, also, very frequently, about 10% of the deals. Okay, so we're done with the seed round deal terms. So now let's talk about sort of the Series A and above. Liquidation preference. This is senior liquidation preference. As you can see, it's really going down. So whereas in 2009, about 55% of the deals had senior liquidation preference, uh, this quarter it's you know, under 35%. And of course, it depends on the round. For instance, in uh, Series B, you know, it's consistently been under 30%. But uh, the, liquid the senior liquidation preference along across the later rounds has really been on decline uh, since you know, the improvement in the economy. Multiple liquidation preferences. Uh, I would say about, you know, I don't have the graph, but about 25% of all deals have multiple liquidation preferences. That means more than one X. Uh, this graph shows you, uh, you know, the distribution. So most, you know, I would say about, you know, 80% have one to two X. Very few have uh, more than two X liquidation preference. Uh, there's been a jump in 2013. Uh, don't know why. Expect it to go down to uh, their regular levels, but uh, something to watch out for. Participating versus non-participating. I think we've gone through that before. So, oh no, no, that was senior liquidation preference. So this is participating versus non-participating liquidation preference. Uh, again, very steady decline from 55% to 2008 to just about 32% in 2013. Cumulative dividends. A lot of investors, especially, I know European deals like to have cumulative dividends. Uh, in fact, never happens in about Silicon Valley deals, it's only in about two to three percent. So don't agree to that. Anti-dilution, you're always gonna have an anti-dilution provision. But in 98% of the cases, it's sort of the broad-weighted uh, average anti-dilution provision. Full ratchet, which is really bad for the founders, um, happens in about two to three percent of the cases. So again, if the investor insists on it, it's not market. Redemption, this is when uh, the, the investor can uh, force the company to buy its shares back after about five years. Uh, also non-standard, uh, it's gone down from 22% to about 14% uh, in, the, in the first quarter of this year. So again, this is very non-standard. So this is my presentation. If you have any questions or if you want a copy of my book, I have my email. And uh, if you've got any questions now or later, just let me know. Oh, my email, okay. This is my email. I'll leave it on the screen for you guys. Hi, my name is Artem. So my question is related to Series A crunch that happens uh, last year and this year. So can you talk a little bit more about it? The Series A crunch? You mean that uh, the companies cannot raise Series A? That's true, yes. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really bad. I mean, I've seen uh, the data, and the data says the companies in 2011 that raised seed financings, only 27% of them were able to raise Series A in the next 18 months. Um, so the data says, well, only about 5% of those companies have actually shut down. but. That's not true. At least in my experience, more than half have shut down. Uh, most companies that raise uh, seed investment and don't get to Series A within 18 months, they don't have any money to continue operations. 
Uh, now, a lot of those companies should not have raised seed money in the first place. I think it's become much easier to raise seed money. So a lot of companies that really shouldn't be getting any money are getting it. But uh, I think it's a bubble. I think it's a bubble. I think people get very excited about raising seed money. They raise, you know, half a million. Um, but that money goes, you know, they hire a bunch of people, and they end up spending that money in five months, and uh, what do they do next? Uh, they really have to shut down. So I, I think it's a problem, and I, I really, um, at least the trends don't uh, show much improvement. Hi, do you have any data on profit, profitability of funds that invest on different stages? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the funds have not been profitable. I mean, the funds, uh, well, it depends on when the fund was founded. So it's called what the year of the fund. The funds that were started in the last you know, five, six years are doing very poorly. Uh, there were a few IPOs, few big exits, they're doing poorly. I would say in the top quartile, uh, if you have about 6% return, you're in the top quartile. Now, you're going to have like the top funds like Sequoia, Excel Partners, who are consistently do very well, even in bad markets. But uh, there's, uh, I mean, I've seen data that shows that, uh, you know, the top 10% of the funds um, account for about 90% of all the profits. So once you get beyond, you know, the best funds, uh, things that don't look very good. Now, I think things are going to improve. But the funds that are about to, you know, the funds that were started in like 2004, so they're about to be shut down and to terminate it, liquidated. They are not doing well, so they're not delivering good results to uh, the limited partners. I'm a startup foreigner. Uh, I have a question. Um, on TechCrunch, uh, there are sometimes um, uh, suggestions for standard term sheets proposed by startup founders. So do you see the standardization of the term sheets over, over the industry? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, again, like when I started practicing 15 years ago, there were probably 20 different term sheets out there. Right now, I think they all look the same. I mean, I would say that over 20 deals that I've done in the last you know, six months, uh, the variation among the term sheets was minimal. So I think they've become standardized, not just term sheets, I think all the documents, the financing documents have become standardized. Okay. Thanks. Leonard, yeah, great presentation, first of all. Question, between Series A and Seed, the um, difference become really blurry lately. Would you agree and how it affects the statistics and the approach that you outlined? Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. I guess I should have uh, made, a, uh, made a caveat. Uh, the seed financings that are included in the, the data set that I showed you guys uh, includes financing of at least 250,000. Once you go down to below 250,000, uh, a lot of them are not on arm's length basis, and they really tend to skew the data. Um, where is the, yeah, there is a blurry line between Series A and Series Seed. You know, you can have a million and a half seed financing and you have a two million Series A financing. Uh, so yeah, you're right, you know, Alex, you're absolutely right. Um, I would still sort of the data shows that most Series A financings are in the three million dollar range. Series seed financings are close to one million dollar range, but somewhere in the middle they meet up and yeah, I don't know, you can call them whatever you want. Uh, my name is Alexander. I'm from Ukraine. Uh, it's not a secret that uh, many investments in uh, the former CIS countries are done partly by uh, in, in cash. I mean, like the briefcase kind of money. Is it possible to show somehow this kind of investment, the cash investment, uh, while issuing convertible notes? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah that, no, that's you're right. reality. You're right. Yeah, that, that you, sound, you really want to avoid uh, bringing a briefcase and giving the founders a briefcase full of cash. Uh, just doesn't look good when you want to raise the subsequent round. Uh, 
It happens all the time, I know. You know, I, I, I deal with the CIS all the time. It happens all the time. And uh, you just got to be able to explain that uh, the money actually exchanged hands. But again, in the end, you know, if you're going to raise the second round, the investor doesn't really care that much whether the original money went in. They all care, you know, how the company's doing. Uh, I have a question. So we, we meet a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, uh, they're raising funding and then uh, you talk to them and they say, oh, you know, so we don't have any structure, that's fine, uh, we're raising money right now and then we will see what will happen and if we get more money. So we have some contracts we wrote ourselves and founding documents we also wrote ourselves. So. Um, at this point, it's for us as investors, it's obviously a red flag. So can you comment on it, how important it is to put together all the uh, legal documents in place? Um, and what happens if you don't? Yeah, guys, uh, if you're going to start a company... Uh, oh, sorry. If you're going to start a company, hire a lawyer. Uh, you know, any, most lawyers here in Silicon Valley are going to put up, uh, you know, create a former company, create all the documents for you for a few thousand bucks. Um, if you decide to do it yourself, uh, you'll have to spend, you know, ten times as much when the investors are doing the due diligence. Uh, again, legal fees have really come down. So you can really have a full set of all the documents you need when you start a company for two grand. $1,500. So it's not really a big deal anymore. And it really saves you a lot of trouble when you're trying to raise money.